30% qu'on a ensuite porté en G20 à Rome. Et ce gap, il est encore en train de s'accroître à cause de deux effets. Ben, les premiers chocs climatiques qui arrivent dans beaucoup de pays et les conséquences de la guerre. Donc, au fond, le contexte d'aujourd'hui impose un choc de financement concessionnel. Et ça, ça vient se percuter sur euh, les, les pertes et préjudices. Mais je dirais que ça préexiste et c'est encore plus large. Donc je permets de dire ça parce que c'est bien ressorti de la, de la discussion qu'on a eue qu eu tout à l'heure. Et euh, donc on a besoin de plus de financement et de plus, besoin de plus de financement innovant pour climat, mais aussi santé, éducation et plus largement pour tous ces pays. Donc ça, c'est le premier point. On a acté qu'on avait besoin de ce choc. On a acté qu'on va faire pression sur les pays qui ne sont pas au rendez-vous de la réallocation de leurs 20%. J'irai moi-même essayer de convaincre au Congrès américain les représentants qui sont les plus réticents, parce qu'on avait devant nous John Kerry et Al Gore, mais ils sont avec nous, ils pensent comme nous, ils sont bloqués dans leur propre système. Donc il faut que tous ceux qui se sont engagés au 20% soient, soient là et apportent leur rendez-vous. Et on doit passer de 20 à 30% de réallocation de ces droits de tirage spéciaux. On a besoin de plus. Premier point sur lequel on s'est engagé. Deuxième point, on a besoin de mieux mobiliser la Banque mondiale. Elle a un triple A. On y engage notre bilan. Elle n'est pas assez mobilisée sur des systèmes de financement innovants pour aller vers ces pays-là. Et donc, ça, c'est un point absolument clé. Ensuite, techniquement, et la banque et le FMI, c'est un des sujets qu'on a ensuite beaucoup discuté, vous savez, quand on a réalloué ces droits de tirage, c'est comment on intervient. On peut intervenir en direct dans les pays, mais il faut un cadre et des programmes. Ce qu'on veut aussi, c'est pouvoir développer le levier, donc avoir des mécanismes où on prend les premières pertes. Parce que pour beaucoup de pays émergents, mais certains pays à revenus intermédiaires, ce dont ils ont besoin, c'est de mieux mobiliser le secteur privé. Et donc, ils ont besoin que nos financements servent à prendre les premières pertes et donnent des garanties pour couvrir le risque pays. Ça, c'est un des points sur lesquels on va avancer. Et puis, dernier point qui est au cœur, au fond, de, de, de cette partie pertes et préjudices, c'est comment on prend en compte la vulnérabilité climatique. Et ça, ça n'existe pas. Et c'est ça, c'est là-dessus qu'on a donc mandaté de manière très claire FMI, Banque mondiale et OCDE, pour nous faire un rapport donc, avant le printemps, et donc euh, dès euh, mars-avril, et on va se réengager avec euh, la première ministre Mia Motley sur ce, sur ce point, pour qu'ils euh, puissent nous aider à définir ces critères de vulnérabilité cli climatique, et en quelque sorte ces clauses. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire de manière très concrète Ça veut dire que quand on a mobilisé des financements internationaux, qui peuvent être ceux de la banque, ceux du FMI, ceux du secteur privé, quand on subit un choc qu'il faut pouvoir qualifier, un ouragan, une sécheresse massive, et que ce choc vous fait porter un risque qui représente plus de X% de votre produit intérieur brut, ce n'est pas vrai que vous pouvez l'assumer tout seul, et ce n'est pas juste. Et à ce moment-là, il faut qu'on puisse activer une clause qui suspend en quelque sorte tous les mécanismes de soutenabilité de votre dette, vos critères qui sont en train aujourd'hui de, de vous enfermer quand vous parlez qui au FMI, qui à la Banque mondiale, qui à vos bailleurs privés, pour activer en quelque sorte des mécanismes d'urgence. Et ça peut arriver à des pays très pauvres, mais ça peut aussi arriver à des pays à revenus intermédiaires qui font énormément de travail, mais qui sont vulnérables, ce qui est le cas de beaucoup de pays insulaires, en particulier caribéens ou pacifiques. Donc ça, c'est une vraie innovation. Elle s'inscrit dans ce paysage plus large que j'évoquais. Donc on va mettre, nous, le maximum d'énergie pour aller plus loin sur les droits de tirage spéciaux, sur plus de réallocation, sur plus de mobilisation de la banque, mais aussi sur une refonte en profondeur de nos règles pour prendre en compte davantage ces critères de vulnérabilité climatique. Et c'est vraiment là-dessus que l'agenda que les Barbades ont mis sur la table, moi qui m'a beaucoup convaincu, et ce partenariat qu'on a décidé de structurer ensemble, on va le poursuivre. Et donc ce groupe d'experts, ce groupe des sages, composé, comme je l'ai précisé, avec en particulier ces trois institutions, plus des experts qui vont mobiliser à l'international, nous rendra compte pour mars-avril, et nous, derrière, on va pousser les choses. La clé, de, la clé derrière ça, c'est la réforme de nos institutions financières, des mandats donnés à la Banque concerned about loss and damage caused by other countries' emissions. That's certainly the reality for our African friends and partners. To them, I say, I hear your call for greater solidarity. The African continent is on the front line of a climate emergency it did not create. 
An emergency that has fueled food insecurity this year made even worse by Russia's unprovoked aggression against Ukraine. For the sake of Africa and for the whole world, we need to do more to deal with the lasting effects of climate change. Those effects can't be undone even with our best efforts. To boost our resilience, we need to adapt now. Of course, all this requires money. So the Netherlands will increase its annual contribution to the $100 billion pledge to 1.8 billion euros by 2025. And as part of this increase, we will double our public finance for climate adaptation, including 100 million euros for the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. All this money needs to go to those hit hardest by climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kingdom of the Netherlands consists of a low-lying delta country on the North Sea and several small island states in the Caribbean. We know from long experience that water, whether too much, too little or too polluted, is de facto linking the great challenges of our time. What's more, 90% of all climate disasters manifest themselves through water, via flooding, drought or pollution. That's why the UN 2023 Water Conference next March is so important. This conference, which we are co-hosting with Tajikistan, will be all about water action. I urge you all to be there. And I urge you to deliver on every climate action promise you have made. I urge you to amplify the voices of women and young people worldwide, because they are still underrepresented when it comes to decision-making on climate change. We still have a long way to go. But I promise you this. You can count on the Netherlands, just as we are counting on you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Ulf Christensen, Prime Minister of Sweden. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Dear Secretary General, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by reaffirming Kazakhstan's solid and continued commitment to the goals and objectives of the Paris Agreement. As you know, our country has set out the ambitious target of achieving net zero by 2060. As part of this, we are planning to adopt our first ever low carbon development strategy by the end of this year. This will mark a historic moment, the first time a country in Central Asia has laid out such an ambitious document. This strategy will update our nationally determined contributions. In it, we will pledge to achieve an unconditional 15% reduction of our carbon emissions by 2030. We have also set a conditional target of 25% that relies on the possibility of additional support from international partners. Currently, green energy represents 3% of Kazakhstan's total energy supply. We have set a target of increasing our renewable energy supply to 15%. That is at least 7 additional gigawatts by 2030. Kazakhstan has the potential to be a global green energy powerhouse. Therefore, we are ready to act as a regional hub for renewables and to drive Central Asia's green transition. Green hydrogen will play, play a key role in this transition. 
International experts believe that our country can become one of the ten largest hydrogen exporters. In addition, Kazakhstan has a unique role to play in the global energy transition thanks to its significant reserves of critical raw materials and elements. Our country holds more than 60 major deposits of precious and non-ferrous metals. We stand ready to offer these critical resources for exploration and development. As well as investing in the future of the energy transition, we are also taking urgent action to mitigate our carbon emissions. Underpinning this effort, the national emissions trading system has already proved to be an effective mechanism for stimulating innovations in both emissions reduction and the energy efficiency. Separately, I would like to mention the importance of technological modernization. There is a critical need to leverage knowledge sharing and technology transfer, including within the Paris Agreement. Therefore, we are developing a framework which will help Kazakhstan to adapt the best available practices from around the world in green technologies. At the same time, we are devoting special attention to stimulating green investment. We are prepared to use the Astana International Financial Center as a unique regional investment hub for green finance. Dear participants, today the temperature in Central Asia is increasing twice as fast as the global average. To meet the urgent demands created by rapid global warming, we have significant adaptation efforts underway within our new environmental code. The focus is on the four most vulnerable sectors – water, agriculture, forestry and disaster risk reduction. Last year, we joined the Declaration on Forests and Land Use and the commitment to education and youth involvement. We are also on track to meet our ambitious target of planting 2 billion trees by 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I would like once again to highlight the scale of the unprecedented challenges we face. In this regard, we require bold solutions and development models that are fair, equitable and sustainable. Kazakhstan is ready to collaborate with all international partners across the entire climate agenda. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Alikhan Smailov, Prime Minister of Kazakhstan, for his statement, and I apologize for the mistake in the announcement. It is it is my pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Ms. Sana Marin, Prime Minister of Finland. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Egypt for hosting us here on the African continent where many of the impacts of climate change are felt most dramatically. While all of us suffer the consequences of climate change, it is the poorest and most vulnerable who suffer the most. I assure you that we are determined to find so joint solutions. The science is clear. If we do not act now, this is only a preview of what is to come. This is the critical decade each year and each action count. Climate change is the biggest global security challenge we face. However, ongoing wars and violence in different parts of the world are magnifying its impacts. Also in Europe, we are witnessing grave violations of international law and the UN Charter, which undermine international security and stability and adore our capacity to work together to find solutions to persisting global problems. Russia's attack on Ukraine is a serious breach of the UN Nation Charter. 
Russia's illegal war affects not only Ukraine, but also the entire rule-based international order, right when we should be acting together against the great challenges of our times. It is Russia's war of aggression that has caused the global food and energy crisis. Now more than ever, we need multilateralism to take quick and effective action against climate change and to assure food and energy security. A green energy transition away from fossil fuels is not only an answer to climate change, but also to energy security. We must make sure this transition happens in a just way, creating new jobs and better opportunities for people everywhere. I also want to stress that we cannot implement the goals of the Paris Agreement without a joint effort from both public and private finance. Therefore, this issue too deserves its place on the agenda. My own country, Finland, has set one of the most ambitious climate targets in the world. We aim to be carbon neutral by 2035. We have put our climate target into law. A new Sami Climate Council has set up at an initiative of the Sami Parliament to contribute traditional knowledge to the preparation of climate policy and measures. Finland has also been vocal in involving women and youth in climate policy making. It is crucial that all groups, including people with disabilities, are able to participate equally in the International Climate Forum. Finland and the European Union are doing their part to deliver climate finance. Finland is particularly doubling its climate finance for developing countries and taking concrete steps apart of the champion group on adaptation finance to double the share of global adaptation financing. As a co-chair of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, we have promoted the integration of finance and biodiversity action into national budgeting. Mr. President, we all agree that what we need to do now is implementation. The longer we wait, the more it will cost. So let us ensure together that this COP is one that delivers real progress in all areas. A COP that keeps the 1.5 degree target alive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Excellency. Distinguished heads of state and government, delegates, honored guests, this brings us to the end of our national statements for today. We will continue with the delivery of national statements tomorrow at 10.30 hours in this plenary. With this, I declare this joint meeting of the COP, CMP and the CMA adjourned. French President Emmanuel Macron, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni and uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz were among the last speakers as we have just ended a, a live broadcast of the